get on the microphone. Okay, so um, anyway, we might as well start with the news. There's always lots of exciting news. Um, that one was kind of interesting. And actually, this one was. And yeah, I don't know about that. But we'll get to this one. Um, yeah, this one's pretty good. And uh, So here's a few interesting ones. Um, so Google wanted to put a uh, data center in Berlin at an abandoned electrical station and the people in the town decided that they would just make the rent go up and they protested and drove them out. Yeah, I was just there in yeah. Germany and they had posters everywhere protesting um, like Google moving in. They were really cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I know the San Francisco, they have the same attitude. They should get rid of all the high-tech companies and the buses, and the, the, and the, the uh, Angela Merkel doesn't like this, and other people don't. I mean, there's people who would actually like to have jobs and companies, but there's people who would rather have a sleepy place. I didn't think Berlin would be like this. I thought some small town. It's, anyway, it's interesting this happened. Google says they left for some other reason, but people think it was the protests, and uh, that is a curious thing to do. This is the Luddite thing, and this is the original sabotage. The original sabotage was the wooden shoes they would throw in the factory to stop automatic shoemaking, automatic uh, factories, so they could take things by hand and have more jobs. It's a, uh, it's not what I like, but it's what some people like. Uh, anyway, um, so IBM, this is a huge problem. If you have a lot of Mac machines, you don't have a domain control, you don't have a deployment server, you don't have a central point of security, so people have to go to third-party products because Apple does not make orchestration products for their, their fleet. And so IBM has made one. Uh, one I've heard is Casper, a lot of people use to be like a domain controller and control the security. And it sounds like this IBM thing is a deployment server to push out software. And so they have uh, this thing, you can install apps with self-serve it and migrate your data from another computer. This sounds very much like it does what Microsoft deployment servers do. Because IBA had to do 277,000 Apple devices at the company, and that's so that's a good idea. A lot of people do have large Mac fleets, and Apple is completely not there to support large fleets. They only seem to think about home users, so it is a big issue. Anyway, uh, so this was an interesting article. Um, the many people have pay like a pen testing team. They tell you about your problems, and then they ask developers to fix it. And what they found here is that um, if you have DevSecOps, they're 11 times faster, which is, you know, the original old business model from 10 years ago is you have business people and then you have an IT department. They have to do everything. You have to ask them to set up the servers and install the software and update it, and they don't really understand the business, and the business people don't know anything about IT. That's the old model. That really doesn't work very well. So then they moved to DevOps, which is what Amazon has, where everybody has to know coding and everybody has to automate their job. So IT is throughout the enterprise, and now they're trying to make DevSecOps where everybody pays attention to the security consequences of what they're doing. And apparently, they, the Faircode found this is enormously more effective. They fix problems 11 times faster. <coughs> if, uh, so it sounds good, and it's the wave of the future, I think. We're trying to get a DevOps program here, and uh, I still suppose after that, we'll have to look at a DevSecOps program. Um, so these guys have invented something to try to improve password security with 65,000 character cryptographic keys created from images. So I'm, uh, sounds kind of nuts, but uh, Matthew Green reviewed their cryptography, I think, and said it was pretty good. And he's, he's quite respected, so maybe it makes sense. Somehow you choose panels here and they turn that into a huge key. And there's something here, what's going on? There we are. Yeah, this one was pretty interesting. If you write a uh, Firefox extension and you get like 100,000 downloads, you will get contacted by companies to buy your extension because they will buy the extension and then put malware on it because that's an open door to infect everybody's browser. And it's the same thing with these Android apps. If you get 
a million people using your Android app, companies will offer you a large amount of money to buy the app so they can then have an update that pushes malware onto the phone. And this has been happening to millions of people. So uh, Google has caught this one and driven them out. There are many, many cycles of poison in the official Android store. And Google catches it, but there's always more. It's a huge problem, and it's probably the main reason why iPhones are much more secure. Anyway, um, this guy said he made an app, and they offered him a lot of money. He took the money, and then he found out they were pushing malware on the phones. Um, well, it is an interesting issue. Are you guilty in that case? Um, I know if you sell guns and people use them to kill people, that's not your problem. Yeah, but that's probably true. If they tell you you're going to rob banks, so he would have to make sure they didn't put in writing that he knew it was going to be used for crime. And they, I'm sure they didn't. So he can maintain plausible deniability, pretend he didn't know. Right. Yes. And, but however, I think, um, yes, I think if they told you the intention, then you would be guilty of conspiring to commit a crime. I would think so. Yes, I would think so. Um, and we talked about this, and may have mentioned here, and, uh, Well, I got it running. I got Chiron running, but it doesn't have any data. I, I have to buy a tap. I have a tap coming on Amazon next week. I have the $20 Chinese tap. Most taps cost $500, but there's a $20 one. So I've got that one. We'll see what I've got. It might just be an empty cardboard box. You know, uh, there's, there may be a reason why it's so cheap, but I'll let you know. Um, my mother always used to tell me, son, you normally usually get what you pay for. Well, that's that could be. I'll let you know. Anyway, so this one, uh, like I say, DNS, DNS or HTTPS is now an official standard to be used. It works. It's very nice. It is kind of insane. And that's why the uh, Paul Vixie that has been involved in DNS from the beginning doesn't like it because it is illogical. There is no way to make an HTTPS connection without first doing DNS resolution. So you can't use DNS or HTTPS until you already use DNS or some other way, which kind of makes sense. But in practice, it seems to work all right, uh, despite its lack of mathematical purity. So that's that's where we're probably all headed. I think it's the only one that's popular. The other the other versions of encrypted DNS are almost never used and are not supported by any major software. So. I think that's what we're actually going to end up using, although it's kind of nuts. And, uh, yes. What it, that's, how, that's what DNS over, that's what it is, DNS over HTTPS, which means you must have used some other kind of DNS to get there. So it's kind of illogical. You couldn't have all your DNS over HTTPS, because how would you ever make the HTTPS connection? I mean, I think that's it's the essence of his complaint. But um, it, of course, there's true a lot of things. You know, switches are not switches at first. They're hubs until they get the first packet, and then they learn to be switches. So there are things that use a insecure system to get going and then switch to the secure thing after they're going, and that's, I guess, how this works. And that might be good enough. It's not mathematically perfect, but, you know, that's how it goes. And we have a moth bypass bug in several softwares, uh, Here's a list of real VNC in 2006. I remember this one in Solaris, MySQL. It's fairly common. Every couple of years, some major product just forgets to check the password. And you can just stay right in with no password. Uh, it's live SSH this time. Anyway, now we're up to the official time. And uh, I think I'll start with the official stuff. I have an extra thing to show you, but I think I'll let it wait until after we talk about um, the Internet of Things, which is the main topic here. So embedded operating systems, um, is the only new chapter in your book. If you have the old version, this is the new chapter that it added. And uh, I think it's appropriate. This is the um, IoT. And before that, we called it the um, SCADA. So this is things, industrial equipment, cars, ATM machines. These are non-general purpose computers. Computers that are built into something and used for only one purpose. And that's, that's this IoT thing. And they turned out to have special security problems. 
So an embedded system is something that's not a general purpose PC. It's typically built using the same kind of hardware and the same kind of software, but it's then just restricted. You don't give it a keyboard and a mouse. You give it just like a few buttons like an ATM machine, and then it only does one purpose. And then it has no... Now, you could use a full installation of Windows and things like the airline ticket machines totally do, but most people prefer to strip it down to make it smaller to fit in a box like your router. And so they, now you could make your own operating system, but that's nuts. Typically you'd strip down all the ones that exist. You can strip down Windows, you can strip down Linux and make it smaller. And that's what people do. Um, you also might need a real time operating system. Um, these general purpose operating systems we use are not real time. If you press a key or a button, you don't know how long it's going to take to react. It might be busy doing something else. And that's normally okay, but it wouldn't be okay if it was, say, driving a car. You really would want to know that it's only going to take this many milliseconds between I hit the button and it has an effect. And that's called a real-time operating system. You have to design it for that. These are designed for flexibility and to make for ease of updates, and they don't care about real-time. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly right. That's why. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And that's what people worry about, especially like gun owners. There's been the technology for a long time. What if you have a gun that recognizes your thumbprint or something? And people have had all these worries. What if you pull the trigger and your gun says, I'm sorry, putting on Windows updates, blue screen of death. They're like, you know, I don't want to hear this. When I pull the trigger, I want it to go. And that's why they've always existed high tech defenses on guns because of probably a well-justified feeling that all that means is it won't work when I need it, which is probably true. Anyway, so then you, uh, and it, there's now computer stuff everywhere. Your router, your heating and ventilation, air conditioning, your burglar alarm, everything is all computerized now. And those are embedded systems. So, and of course, they are not written fresh. They are just recycling standard things like taking an old simple version of Linux with the usual libraries and putting it in, except they usually forget to put in any update process. So they are fantastically insecure typically. Um, Windows had a version called Windows CE for compact, uh, for embedded system or something, compact version. Um, and the idea here is that you reuse code that's much cheaper and better for everybody, you use the same drivers. So Windows 10 has Windows 10 IoT is the version of stripping down Windows 10 to make a special one. So you can get various, well, Windows IoT core is the smallest, and for mobile devices here, you can add more components. And really, all this is essentially is going in, adding, remove Windows components, and removing a lot of components until you have just what you need. Um, VxWorks is another one that's been around for a really long time. Um, and they, they reuse them in spacecraft, and I think they used to use it a lot in routers. I think some routers still do use VxWorks. Um, uh, operating systems, and they have a thing called VxWorks Workbench, which is the software you use to make the version you're going to put on your device, and all it is is just basically a package manager, where you say, I need I need Ethernet, but I don't need wireless, I don't need Bluetooth, but I need files, hard, don't need a hard disk driver, but I need an SSD driver. You know, you, you pick what you need and put it in, and then you have a small system that has just what you need and nothing else. This is what Arch Linux is. There are people that love Arch Linux. Arch Linux, you have to compile it yourself for your hardware, and it doesn't include any drivers for hardware you're not using. So it takes 36 hours to compile, and then supposedly runs a lot faster and better because it doesn't have all this extra junk you're not using, which Windows and, and stuff like Ubuntu totally do. They have thousands of drivers for things you're not using. Yeah. Did you say it took 36 hours? 36, 36 hours. 36 hours to compile? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And, and what the people that do that feel real leaked, and their machine is like better, and uh, they showed up at DEF CON, and that's what, um, Liz was there to help me, thank God. I went to a DEF CON workshop, they had to run a virtual machine, and there were like four people with Arch that couldn't run VMware, they couldn't run VirtualBox, they couldn't do anything, and she figured out somehow how to get them running. <laughs> I think she figured out how to put VirtualBox on their Arch. Everything is much, much harder. If you want to be really elite, you use Arch or Slackware. Both of them make everything very, very difficult, but it is more mathematically perfect and pure. And you can impress everybody with how cool you are because you can get something done on Slackware, whereas everyone else just gives up and uses Ubuntu. Um, so they do things faster? It is faster, more secure. You're in complete control of everything. It's sort of like having your own OS, you know. Um, and of course, you learn a lot about Linux. Um, uh, the um, hacking teacher I know, uh, Joe McRae, teaches in, in, near the NSA over in Baltimore. 
He has an online apprenticeship class, which is incredibly ruthless to teach you to be a pen tester. It covers about as much as all my classes put together in the first six weeks and then keeps going. And I think by the third week, you have to make your own Linux from scratch. You can do that. You can Google it. There are kits to make your own Linux. Put in a kernel, put in choose this, choose that, put in some drivers, put in some software and make your own Linux. And that is what you really ought to do if you want to get really good at it, of course. After that, you'll really understand how Linux works a lot better. Yes, yeah. really OS, OS what? OS exploits. Well, I imagine, yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose. I mean, that's the point. I mean, you're trying to get up to the level of military attackers, and the military attackers are really very good. So, anyway, um, Green Hill is another one that makes uh, embedded systems for fighters. And Qnix is Cisco's ultra high availability router. Cisco has this thing called IOS with a capital I instead of a small I. And that is their internet network operating system used in an ordinary Cisco router that you'd see in Iraq. But Cisco is, and Cisco is competing with a lot of companies there, like, Jun like uh, Juniper and other companies will make something that will do the networking for a few buildings. But if you are an ISP and you have a thousand or two million times more traffic than one corporation, then you have to get really high-end routers, and Cisco is alone there. They, when I went to tour Cisco a few years ago, they showed us a new router that would handle like 10,000 terabits per second or some enormous amount of traffic, and it was 18 racks full of routers, all in sort of a cluster, and that does not run iOS, it runs this, QNIX. They have a special operating system with a really high performance, they are alone, nobody else is in them. Just like Microsoft is alone, if you are a multinational corporation with a million desktops in a thousand locations, Microsoft domain controllers are the only thing you can use to really manage all that. Nobody else is even shooting at that market. That's, there's have a lot of money, and you really have to have a lot of specialized stuff. And Microsoft totally has, there are seven certifications in Microsoft Windows domain controllers. And that's what you get. If you get up to the end of that, you become someone that flies around the world to the largest corporations in the world, fixing their big problems. Uh, a similar thing you could do is master border gateway protocol. I know a guy that does that, Ed Horley, and he, there are not very many people that can really master it, and you have to do it, and they pay to fly in consultants to fix their BGP, because your whole company relies on it, and it is very easy to mess up. Um, so anyway, those are, those are elite careers. Um, all right, so there's another one. RT MEMS is another real-time OS used in spacecraft. And uh, here's a general uh, technique here. Now, the normal operating systems we use, like Windows and the Mac OS and everything, are monolithic OSs. And this is segmentation. You may remember the OSI model with seven layers. This is how you make something cheap and adaptable. I and mean, when I started with all this long, long ago in the 70s, the first home computers like the Vic 20 and the VIC-64 from Commodore had, were not monolithic as far as I could tell because you had to buy a printer and then you had to buy a word processor specifically to go to that printer. And if you, a new printer came out, you couldn't use it with your old word processor. You had to get a new word processor that could talk to the printer. And that is the kind of, that was okay when there's only a few vendors and only a few products, but after you have the modern world, that's not acceptable anymore. And so what you need to do is have layers of product here. So you have device drivers in their own special layer and your software is way up here in the application layer. So I can run Microsoft Word and it doesn't know anything about what kind of printers I'm going to use. That's a whole different issue. And whoever manufactures a printer, they have to give you a disk or a download with a driver. And once it puts in the driver, your same old software can use it because it has these layers of translation. So this is much better. It means every, it's like modular code where everyone writes a little function instead of writing a whole application. So you write a little function like a device driver and it's separated from all the other things you might want to do. That is much more versatile, and it grows, and it separates the duty into layers, and there's the reason the OSI model is that way. You can make a switch, and you can make your switch faster, and you can add special features, but it doesn't affect the router. Because the switching is on one device, the routing's another device, and they're just modular components. That's the best answer for general purpose computing. But the problem is, um, it means you have this problem with the real-time operating system. This is why you don't know how long anything takes because you hand it to one layer, which hands it to another layer, which hands it to another layer. Each of them have their own bugs and they might be busy. And so you really don't know how long it's gonna be before it takes effect. And that also means you're wasting a lot of resources. This is what I said, people don't like, this is what arch people avoid. Your Windows operating system has got drivers for thousands of hardware components that you're not using. 
It's all there in case you put it on a different machine. And that's why the same Windows install disk goes on millions of machines. That's really highly inefficient. Most of that software is never used. So if you really want to make something like a router that is small or a cell phone that will run the longest battery, you don't want all this extra stuff you're not using. You want this where you strip it down to the bare minimum. And now you can have, have less time delay and it'll run faster, have less RAM, less hard disk space or less... You know, it will be smaller and faster, but now if you change anything about the hardware, you're going to have to also change the operating system to match it. And that's what you have with Slackware. Every time you put on an application, you have to recompile the kernel because it doesn't have any extra stuff. Yeah. I do not know if Arch is microkernel, but it's like it's in that direction. It's a good question. I imagine it's probably still had this design, but it is optimized for your hardware, so it will be less wasteful than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's this, it's stripped down to some extent. This is stripped down to the max. And of course, if you were making, so if you were making an all purpose computer, you want to sell to a million people and they're all going to do different things, then you want this system. And that's what most people want. But if you're going to make something like a watch and you want it to just be a watch and have it cheap and small and have the battery last as long as possible, then it would be worth customizing your OS to have nothing except the, exactly what you need and nothing more. So uh, Unix in Linux is, most, is mostly used for this purpose. Linux, Linux people are very proud of the fact that it gets really small. There are versions of Linux that fit on a floppy disk. They're less than one megabyte. You can strip it down to almost nothing. You can use the version from decades ago. It really did everything you need. It handles the RAM and the hard disk and the keyboard and the network. Um, and that's why Linux is mostly what people use when they're really going to strip things down. Um, but the problem is, as we all know, Linux is hard to use and normal people would rather use Windows. And so if you want it to actually be easy for your programmers and easy for your customers, you might prefer to just pay for more hardware to give them the luxury of using Windows. And that's what a lot of people do. There's real-time Linux. This is a microkernel version that will have that real-time property where you know how long it's going to take between requesting something and have it done. And you can have, there's Linux for routers. Um, you can, the uh, routers come with a, typically proprietary operating system, but you can reflash them with an open source operating system. Uh, it is usually less reliable because it's not usually customized to the hardware, but it means you can turn on all the features. Uh, there are really only like four manufacturers of wireless cards and they put like 20 brand names on the outside, but there's really only four components in there. And even the components in your cheap home routers have all the features of the enterprise ones. So people say, this is how you turn your $30 router into a $300 router. You can use all those features that are blocked but you typically lose some uh, reliability when you do that. And DDWRT is one of the open source projects writing firmware that you can place with routers and it will do things like now you can monitor how much bandwidth one customer is using, which is like NetFlow. That's something ISPs have that home users typically don't have, but you could have that feature by just replacing the software in your router. And OpenWRT is another one. Uh, like most, all open source products seem to have to do something naughty just to show off the fact that they didn't go through corporate. So these guys name every version after a drink and they put the recipe for the drink up there. Um, like Ubuntu's new version is called uh, Chauncey Cadillac or something stupid. They, they all are named after animals and they all sound brand. I Way back at version F, which is maybe 2006, I saw the blogs and corporate executives are saying, will you please knock it off? I want to convince my corporation to use your product, but because it's named Feisty Fawn, I can't use it. If you called it Ubuntu Linux Enterprise Desktop version 7, we would be using it. <laughs> but I can't go to my corporate board of directors and say we're going to base our company on Feisty Fawn. And, and, well, you know, well, you know, shortly after that, they tried putting ads on the desktop and having certification and service. You know, they would like to have some money. This is what a lot of people do. They act like idiots. And then they say, why don't we have any money? I say, well, you know, if you want money, you have to put on a suit and talk the language and talk to those big shots and stop insulting them. And then you can have some of their money. But if you parade about the fact that you're drunk on the job, then you're not going to get the money. That's how it goes. You can either be a spoiled brat or you can grow up and get the money. You can't have both. And typically what you do is you have people on your team. You have some professional looking guy to go talk to the corporate people and you hide the hackers away so he won't see how horrible they are. This is how pen testing teams are. You have a bunch of crazed lunatics in, in t-shirts with, 
dirty words on them doing the hacking and you have some guy wearing a suit to talk to the corporate guy about the results and you prevent him from ever seeing. I used to be that guy. I used to be the guy that would hide in the back room with my torn shirt, doing the database, they have other people talk. Occasionally, they bring me in to talk to them and say, oh, oh, this is Sam, he'll answer your question. Okay, now leave, because <laughs> you know, I was like an embarrassment. That's, what's that? I think that's just people's feelings. It is, but if you want to be a success in this business, it's very good to do both. It's very good to become the interface. I think that's where the real value is. If you can learn how to talk to hackers and talk to management, then you're really gonna be enormously valuable. That's why I like things like the CISSP certification, because that is the pain point. That's, anyway, um, so OpenWRT has a GUI and you can install all your software. You can just pick off a large list of open software packages. It looks really great. In fact, it doesn't work so well. I tried to use this uh, 15, 10 years ago with Kirk. He spent like two years trying to get IP version six running. And, you could, you could install this on a router and you could start installing software, but by the time you install the third or fourth package, everything starts crashing because the hardware is weak and all these things are kind of bug ridden. And you know, it looks like you can do all this stuff, but if you try doing it, you'll find out you're pretty limited in what you can actually accomplish on the hardware. Anyway, so um, all these OSs have vulnerabilities. They typically have a ton of vulnerabilities because they have sacrificed security to get them so small and fast. And um, they also don't have a keyboard or anything, so they often have just a default password that's difficult to change and people don't find it. One of the things I thought was funny, there was, I think, some router that had um, an administration panel and you could change the password, but it had by default SSH, Telnet, HTTP, and HTTPS. And they were all four turned on and they all had a default password. So if you changed the SSH password, it didn't change the others and you didn't know that. <laughs> So you think you changed the password, but you didn't really. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that tends to happen. So here's one that affected a lot of home routers and cable modems. Um, Windows Mobile has the usual flood of vulnerabilities, except a problem is there's typically no automatic update, and often no easy way to put the update on. Um, yeah? When they infect a router, they're literally like putting up new firmware, right? Well, they're doing whatever they want, but typically when you infect a router, you you install malware on it, which will add malware to things you download through it, or scan your network, or live in there. Um, one of the early ones was uh, Bugbear. Bugbear would infect your network, and it would infect the printer and live in the printer. So when you re-image all the desktops and boot them up, they get infected again. So it was, you also had to clean the printer, which people didn't know how to do, and on it goes. It was, um, and well, once you were in the router, also, now, one of the things people did is they took over a lot of routers and used them to scan the internet for vulnerabilities. And then they used them for DOS, DDoS army. That's a big one for the last several years. They take over millions of routers. They're, now you have a lot of little weak computers, but there's so many of them, they can add up to an army to do things with. So I guess what you're saying is the router has also firmware, has an OS, it also yeah. has some user land. It does. Like this, you can put on packages on your router like this. It's not something you normally do, but it can be done. It's really just a little Linux machine. Same thing with your cell phone. That's one thing that has never happened, and most security experts expected it years ago, is a cell phone botnet, especially Macs. We expected it because Macs are all exactly identical, but Apple is not stupid, and they have really secured the Mac to where it's really hard to do that. Android is very insecure, but they're all different. It's diverse, so it's hard to make it spread. You know, what you need to make this work is you need a large population of exactly identical devices without much security, and home routers and IoT are where you find it. There really are millions of webcams all with the same problem. Typically, and because there's no keyboard or screen, people don't know that they've been hacked, and they don't know how to change the password anyway, so they put up some webcam to monitor their garage, and then everybody starts using it in botnets, and they don't know. And that's what's been happening. So, um... Anyway, they're all over the place, and uh, you can hack, you can profit in various ways. One way to profit is by taking over ATMs and making them spit out the money. That's jackpotting. Um, and there were embedded devices everywhere. The Y2K flaw was the first one that raised this to people's awareness because of all the COBOL code that actually stored the year as a two-digit decimal date. So when it went from 1999 to 2000, it thought it was 1900. Now, nowadays, Unix systems store the time as the number of seconds since January 1, 1970. It's this long number, and there's nothing special about the year 2000. But COBOL actually stored it in a more simple way, and there was actually a problem here. And they had to bring a lot of people out of retirement to come back and fix all that COBOL code. 
Um, I mean, I saw a blog or something. The guy said he got his house that way. Yeah. Uh, yes, Unix does have a similar flaw coming in like 2032 when it will roll over. 32-bit uh, Linux. So people are talking about that. In 2032, there'll be another Y2K flaw. But a generation of Linux software is going to have some kind of crisis. <laughs> um, I haven't read the detail. I think it will only affect Linux that's really badly out of date. But that's going to be a lot of it because this is the fundamental problem. I mean, the computer... Computer software makers and operating system makers are like typical corporate people. They think in like three month cycles. Anything this quarter is fine. Three years from now is like the un unimaginable future. And anything more than four or five years old, that's ridiculous. Nobody would use that anymore. But people who make enterprise class hardware think I'm going to put up an aircraft control tower. We're going to use it for 40 years. I'm going to put up a water pump for a sewage treatment plant and it'll run for 100 years. And they don't think about the fact that the computer system will be considered badly out of date in like five years. They say, what are you talking about? This thing is fine. You know, it's still pretty much okay, except your power plants will melt down. Exactly. Exactly. Because the, the people that build hardware, they think about the mechanical operation and they say, this thing is good for 30 years. And they don't understand why the computer becomes useless in just a few years for no apparent reason. It's just as good as it ever was. Why is that not good enough? And the answer is because security standards keep changing. So building your software the way it was considered good enough in the 90s is totally not good enough now. And that's, they feel really ripped off because they work hard to make something that really runs for 30 years and now you're telling me the computers are broken for no particular reason. But that's the way it is. And that leads, and they typically had no way to update the computer software. So it is a problem, but there is a solution. And the solution is to protect it with devices from the outside. You have some old vulnerable thing that could be hacked so you don't connect it directly to the internet. You put a VPN concentrator on the outside and that you update. And now this is like taking children that are, don't have any sense. They're helpless and vulnerable and they'll just run off from, with anybody that offers them candy. You don't try to change the children. You put them in a fenced yard and protect them on the outside. You say, well, they remain vulnerable, but they're safe because we put a defense outside them. That's what you have to do here. Yeah, you send them to school on the bus. You make sure the teachers I, I, you know, are really counting the kids and making sure they're not wandering off. You, you call the cops if creepy guys are hanging around trying to pick up the kids and all that. You, know, you protect them because they are vulnerable. And you have to do the same thing with your devices. All right. And uh, let's see. I'll get this. I seem to be there. It's moving. All right. So anyway, um, the, many people have uh, uh, manuals that tell you not to connect your IoT things to the Internet. They call it air gapping them. And the problem with that is um, they tell you to air gap them, but nobody does. And I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this. They say you shouldn't connect this thing to the internet. Well, the whole point of having it computerized is to connect to the internet. For example, if you have water treatment plants that like all the cities in your state, you don't want the guy maintaining it to have to fly to all those cities to update them. You connect to the internet, now he can log into some console and update them. That's the idea with ATM machines and everything else, they are connected to the internet. That is the whole point. Even though they'll put in the net, they don't want to accept the security responsibility. So they put in the book, don't connect it to the internet, but that's garbage. So what you should do is connect it to the internet through a VPN concentrator, which is secure. And then you have some reason to believe that people have proven they are authorized before they get on the same network as this vulnerable device. Anyway, uh, they're all over the place. They're all connected to the internet. People are connecting to them remotely and that's a big issue. So the Mirai botnet is one of the big ones, 620 gigabits per second coming from all these webcams taken over. These are just wireless cameras and they were all installed with like a default password and the, the people just plugged them in and turned them on and they worked and they said, great. And they were unaware of the fact it's being used by criminals and um, there was no facility for securing them and nobody bothered. And I, that's a lot of these, you just use default names and passwords and there were many brands all with the default password. This is true of most home routers. I remember I had a, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I was at home, I had like a Linksys router. And then one day I was looking at the firewall and there was a port open, which I didn't open. And the guy in my house had installed AOL software and AOL software would just log in with the default name and password and open the ports to make it run. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Didn't ask me, you're nothing. <laughs> that's rude. <laughs> but you know, that's what people do. And of course, then I changed the password, then I knew what was going on. Anyway, um, 
So you have the general purpose desktop operating system. It's pretty easy to patch. It's connected to the internet. You have a keyboard and a mouse. It can pop up a box and say time to put on the updates and you might actually do it. But these embedded OSs typically have no way to alert you. There's no light to turn on. I mean, how can your webcam tell you, I need a patch, I'm out of date. It doesn't have a speaker. You'll never, even if the manufacturer knows it's out of date, there's no way to get the user to do anything. <laughs> What they should have done, of course, is design it in the first place with some facility for them to push out an update. But they didn't think of that because all people care about is the lowest price. And so that's why there's a move. Mudge has been trying to do this for years, one of the most famous and most influential hackers. Uh, you're trying to get cyber UL listing because electrical components used to be really bad and burn down people's houses and short out all the time. And then they developed the UL testing where you have to take your extension cords and toasters and everything and get them tested by a laboratory, underwriter's laboratory, and then you put a sticker on it saying this device has been tested and people would buy it with that sticker on it. And he wants to have a cyber UL listing where you'll, your router and everything will have a sticker saying this actually meets a certain security standard and therefore it's worth paying an extra few bucks for it. That might work, but no one can decide even yet exactly what that test should be. They're still arguing about it. But it would be sort of nice if there were federal restrictions or licensing or at least some kind of independent label to put on it. Uh, that would help. Then consumers would have some way to know which product to buy. Anyway, um, so you've got open source software out there, of course. This is one good thing to do. I mentioned before, you shouldn't make your own OS unless you're nuts. You should get in one of these channels, like use BSD. There's a very vigorous, very intelligent community supporting BSD with constant patches and updates. And if you just use BSD, you can exploit all that value for free, or Windows for that matter. There's a huge company making all the patches you need. That's far better than making your own OS and then having to deal with all the problems yourself. Um, and pacemakers, internal embedded medical devices are vulnerable like crazy because they've been designed dealing with a different risk profile. The point of a pacemaker is to make sure it will keep running, make sure it's small and light, make sure the battery will last a long time before having to do surgery to replace the battery. And that's what they wanted. And they didn't think about security. So they had wireless signals that were not encrypted in authentication and anybody could take over your pacemaker because they were thinking of a different threat model. They were thinking of, what is the patient going to get infected and die? Not, is someone going to cyber attack the pacemaker? And almost all medical equipment is wide open to cyber attack because this is a new threat. And this is what I am the Cavalry and Joshua Parman's group has been doing for the last several years, is adding just the most basic level of security to medical devices and finding appalling weaknesses everywhere because they were on a different track. They weren't thinking about this problem at all. Anyway, so uh, I've got some cahoots. I think they're all ready to go in one of my windows here. Yeah, so this is 9A, all right. You know, I used to say these guys are stupid and they should have thought of that and I got over it. You know, the fact is they had other fish to fry. Their first issue was to save the patient's life by making it work. And cyber attacks were like science fiction at that time. So they did the right thing. They solved the problem that mattered right then. But there comes a time when you have to actually solve the next problem. <laughs> oh, I should get a text document to record the winners. So I'll wait a few more seconds. Justin Bieber, that's good. We got Taylor Swift in the world of security. I haven't seen Justin Bieber on security, but that would be a good Twitter handle. A believer, right? Sure. So, all right. So, which one is used by spacecraft? Okay, that's VNX, VX works, I mean. By the way, there's a special protocol used for space called DTM. Uh, suppose, think about this. I'm gonna talk to the moon. So the light will take 10 minutes to get there. Now, consider the TCP handshake. I send SYN, now I wait 10 minutes for SYNAC, then I wait 10 minutes for ACK. 
This is nowhere. So they have new protocols called delay tolerant network, where you send it and it's processed right away. You don't wait for a reply before sending more. You've got to have a different protocol for that purpose, and that's DTN for spacecraft. You've got to forget all this handshake, forget all this reply, make everything delay tolerant, where you send whatever it is, like a package, it gets there and hopefully works, but you know, then you find out two hours later there was a problem, but most of the time it just works. Anyway, um, all right. So we're kind of embedded OS is the most common. Okay, the monolithic is the most common. Like I say, it's the cheapest and general purpose. Most embedded OSs are running complete OSs like Windows, like yours. That is clearly the easiest for everybody to use and paying for a little more RAM and stuff is typically worth it for the convenience of the developer and the product and everybody. That's why if you buy an airline ticket or anything, that thing is a Windows machine. If you watch it boot up, it's just a full Windows operating system, which from a security point of view is a terrible idea because that has a lot of vulnerability. But just to manufacture it, that is the most easy way to make it out the door. Just take a standard whole computer and put it in there. All right. Um, all right. Which one is put on routers? Went to DEF CON like five or six years ago and somebody put a fake ATM in the casino and it was just like a, a, a stereo entertainment system you buy at like uh, a hardware store with like a smoky front plastic panel. And if you took a close look, you could see a PC sitting in there. It was pretty funny, but it looked kind of like an ATM. Uh, it was there for a while and it was gone. I don't know if anybody actually used it or anything. <laughs> I'm sure that would be some monstrous crime if they caught you, but. It was a pretty good joke anyway. So, all right. Which botnet took over webcams? Okay, so that was the Mirai botnet. I don't know where they got that name, but it was a big hit. So the face, that's Steven, right? Okay, good. I'm getting on to it. Okay. So uh, it's, yeah, yeah. maybe you ought to take a break till five minutes, too. We're a little bit early, but it'd be better to let people stay awake. So Steven, we'll pick up in 10 minutes, so five minutes, too. And XC, I don't know who that is. Are they here? Well, they might tell me who they are at some point. And Casper might, it's probably another name. It's not a real name. So if those folks want their points, they're gonna to have to give me a clue who they really are. But Steve and I got. All right. University of Maryland. Um, oh, you mean Joe McRae? He's not at university, he's an independent teacher. And now he's all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, he's not he's not at a university. Ah, right. XC, good. Okay, thank you. I now know who XC is. All right. And I'm going to um, Okay, and I'm going to stop the recording, but the share will keep going so people can still chat and stuff, but I'll stop the recording. Anyway, let's uh, carry on with this. Oh, here's the chat coming in. Uh, do you think getting a four-year degree in IT is worth it? Um, it's required for a lot of jobs. A student was just complaining yesterday. Many jobs require a four-year degree, and they often require it in a computer science. So it's absolutely a good thing to have. There are some jobs available without it, but it will open doors for you. So, I mean, if you have any, pro any reasonable chance of getting a four-year technology degree, I recommend it. That's a good investment in your future. I think it's a little overvalued, but in reality, a bunch of people require it. You know, it's like a security clearance. A bunch of things are not open to you until you have it, and that degree is similar. Anyway, so um, let me try and move this thing off the screen as much as I can, and off we go. All right, so uh, your networking devices, like your firewall, your router, your switch, your load balancer, those are all running computers too. They have RAM, they can be infected. Your network card has a microprocessor in it and some RAM and it can be infected. You can put malware in the things that aren't even considered computers. They're all little computers. And so if you take over a router, you can then use it to scan the network and, and uh, 
attack various devices. And uh, you can also even put malware on the page that pops up to tell you route a paper and things like that. So uh, routers typically have authentication bypass vulnerabilities. They're typically very insecure. Some of them have like the administrator passwords in the source code of the web page, or there's SQL injection or other very simple attacks that will get you right in. Um, there's been several contests, one of years ago, another one at DEF CON. Um, Soho, they call it DEF CON, so hopelessly broken because they call them Soho routers, small office, home office, and they're all fantastically vulnerable. Just the usual, if, if tiny Linux is like 10 years out of date, not patched, all full of ridiculous holes typically. Um, so here's one, this one was pretty funny. I did this one a few years ago. D-Link had a vulnerability where all you had to do was change the user agent in your browser request to this, which has the word backdoor backwards in it. And when you connect, now you're the administrator. And it was even where I set it up and really did it. It was unbelievable. As soon as anyone connects with that user agent, everyone is permanently root from now on. And the only way it is to reflash the router back to default to get rid of it. It was amazing. This was like, there are often backdoors when you're manufacturing something for when you make a bug, an error in the code, there's some way back in, but they forgot to remove it before shipping it to production. And that happens a lot. Um, so, your printers, your scanners, your multifunction devices, they are all computers too, and they can all connected to networks. They can all be hacked. And they even have good things on them. They have all the things you've been printing and faxing on them, and that could very well be proprietary sensitive data. So just stealing the print jobs off the printer is not a small target. Not, and um, you can also, of course, mess with the printer, change the messages. Um, people do, in, in fact, there's an old fashioned denial of service attack you take three pages together and run them through a fax machine and send an endless bunch of faxes to people. And this will tie up their phone line and use up all their paper and ink. And it's actually a major crime because it's got to do with the phone network. But you can do various things like that. And like I say, you can make it so these pages that configure the printer have links that go to malware or something. Um, what's that? A black fax? I've heard of them where it's just all black to use up your ink. Yeah. Yeah, there are a bunch of these attacks. And for this time when people did this for political complaints, like when they want to protest something, they would do this. Like now everyone's sending letter pipe bombs to everybody they don't like. They would take a company that offends them and they would send them all these irritating faxes to hurt them. Like the Alcus Armed Cyber Army did that essentially. It hurt American banks to punish America for putting up a video about Mohammed. So, you know, if you if you have a political grievance, this is one way to express it. What's that? Yeah, telemarketers. Yeah, telemarketers are similar. Yeah. And people attack them and they themselves represent an attack. Then there's SCADA systems. This is the term also called ICS for computer equipment that controls a big industrial thing, like an aircraft control tower, a nuclear plant, a canning factory. I went online and found these with uh, Shodan a while ago. I found a bunch of ones online you could play with that were really connected to real systems and factories. Um, or some of them were simulations, but you know that there a lot of them were just connected to the internet and not protected by anything. I think I told you years ago I found a check printing outfit in Texas that was printing real checks for a, a Canadian insurance company, and it was on you could see the checks and all of them going by. It was directly on the internet with no password or anything. This kind of thing, and it was a hard time, took me a while to figure out who to notify because they didn't identify themselves anywhere. Anyway, uh, this is the thing. All the devices are out there, and they're supposed to be protected by an air gap, but they frequently are not. And Project Aurora was the military, uh, the Army did this to demonstrate that you could physically break hardware with a cyber attack. This was not believed possible until this happened. And this was, of course, warming up to what we did to the Uranians with the nuclear isotope separator. But if you can infect the firmware that controls the mechanical motor, you can cause it to run the motor improperly and break it. And they caused this motor to blow up. And that was the demonstration that you can physically destroy hardware with a cyber attack. So it is somewhat like a real attack with a bomb or a gun or something. Um, and Stuxnet was, of course, the, the outcome of this. The United States and Israel worked together to take down the Iranian isotope separators, and it really worked. It held back the Uranium nuclear program for years in a relatively bloodless way. Far better than sending airplanes to bomb their factory or anything, far less collateral damage. Um, and so there's a, I went and found a presentation about this, talking about the air gap a few years ago and pointing out uh, that they, the air gap is a fiction. People really connect all this stuff to the internet. And I'm not going to play it this time because I have another thing I want to show you, but there's a fun video here about these Dell remote access controllers. Um, if you buy Dell servers, it comes, you can get a DRAC unit, which lets you 
power cycle of the server and connect to it. So the uh, power is connected to a network controlled device. And recently this has been hitting the, uh, the security news. Uh, there's a listening port on all server class devices that you can't block, which lets you control the, the power to your servers. And um, be, yes, you can, you can turn off the server. And uh, that's the main thing that you do, but and they're often, and typically they don't think about security. This one here, they just have a default name and password and they expect you to just use it. So, you know, it's because they don't think anybody will find it. And this dates all the way back to 30 years ago. Um, the machines, uh, PBX machines, you would, if you had your own company, you'd want to have your own telephone network. So instead of routing everything through the telephone company, you'd get your own PBX system. So you'd have the first three digits, and the last four digits would be inside your company, and that traffic would never go to the phone company at all. It would go to your PPX and go to your extensions, and then you could program stuff. But the, typically, those things were controlled by computer systems, and what they did was they took one of those numbers, and that was the control number, and there was no other security. If you knew that number, you could just take over the box. And Cisco routers were intended for this. Cisco routers have a port called the, um, the console. There's a console port. There's another port there called AuxCon or something. There's a special port. The purpose of it is to connect to your PBX on a phone line, and the idea is that will control the router with no further authentication. All you have to do is dial the right number and you get in, because that's the way it was normally done until about 10 years ago. That was the standard. And just knowing that number was enough. Yeah? Um, that port, is it, is it still being used right now? Yes, yes. This, particular, this device is something you would buy, but if you buy any enterprise class servers, they are listening on a high number port, 50,000 something, and you can't turn it off. It's in the firmware, it's not in the server. You could replace the whole hard drive, that wouldn't affect it. It's in the firmware of the device. And people are getting upset about it. Of course, it's not supposed to be routed to the internet. You're only supposed to get to it locally, but it is, it's available for remote control and people get upset about it. So there's some news about it now. People should be aware of it and they often are not. Is there a way to block it with some kind of internal software or something? There's nothing you can do on the server to block it, but you could block it in a firewall on the outside. And that would be the way to control it. And that's why that's the general answer to all um, embedded devices that are vulnerable is you put some security device outside them to protect them. That's the way to do it. Anyway, and here's here's DRAC systems on the internet. You're not supposed to connect them directly to the internet, but a bunch of people did. I found them on Shodan. You know, it's um anything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> and uh, here he found a lot of other things on there. Passenger jets are supposed to be listening on telnet ports. I don't know if they still were and things like that. Um, and the Department of Homeland Security, when they were jumped into action to say that this is an, an industry-wide problem, it's not a bug, and therefore they're not going to do anything about it. It's outside their purview. Um, this is true uh, when a few years ago at DEF CON, a guy found that all the um, manuals for the security at the McCarran Airport in Las Vegas were on a public share including the passwords and everything. And he was afraid that he might be committing a federal crime by viewing it. So he went to Google and found that Google had in fact indexed and cached it all before. So you could look at the Google cache without even connecting them. And then he tried to tell people and it took him nine months to find anybody that cared. TSA didn't care, DHS didn't care, FBI didn't care. Everybody said it's somebody else's problem. This is what usually happens when you try to report a vulnerability is nobody takes responsibility. Anyway, it's your cell phones, of course, or computers, your smartphones, your and PDAs, if those are still around, and all of them have vulnerabilities and malware and soft, and it can be attacked. And uh, this is hitting the news today. Trump supposedly uses an ordinary iPhone for some of his calls, and ordinary iPhones are totally vulnerable. Now, the phone itself is very secure, but it goes in the phone network, and the phone network is very insecure. This has been known for 15 years. Phones use a signaling system to route the phone calls from device to device, and that is really old, and it's called SS7, Signaling System 7. It hasn't been updated in a long time, and you can intercept the voice traffic and reroute it, and everybody knows it. The exploits have been known for years, and they haven't fixed it because they're going to have to change all the installed infrastructure worldwide that is routing those calls, and that's expensive. So if you use a normal phone, People can intercept that traffic and the claim in the New York Times today, which is very plausible from what I know, is that the Chinese and the Russians are just listening to all that. And that's why the president is not supposed to use a normal phone. When Obama got in there, he loved his Blackberry. And as soon as he became president, they took away his Blackberry and they said, you have to use this special military grade Blackberry instead for just this reason. You can't be using normal consumer communication systems because none of them are secure enough. 
but supposedly they haven't uh, managed to convince Trump to knock off using his normal phone. Yeah. It is. It is. It's encrypted. That's right. Encrypted to the tower. Yeah, when it goes through the phone network, a lot of that is really old and really insecure. Yeah, that's why actually voice over IP might be safer because that'll go over the internet and that's often encrypted with HTTPS or something. You know, there's uh, the, the problem with the phone network is some of those wires are really old. This is why people complain about Hillary sending unencrypted email. But the fact is, if you send email to other nations, you have to send it unencrypted. Very few nations actually have the ability to receive encrypted email. So you can't, and they don't have the ability to get secure telephone service either. If you talk to them, you're talking over the unsecured line, and there's no choice. Anyway, um, so there are cell phone vulnerabilities. People can put malware on your phone. Uh, you can buy commercial monitoring things to put on your kid's phone to hear their calls, record their texts, find out where they are, see if they're driving too fast. Um, people like that. Some parents want to do that. Some bosses want to do that. And if you infect your phone, you can, of course, find your location, turn on the microphone, turn on the camera. All that jazz is available. And um, here you can buy this. You can just buy a phone root kit. They are anti-theft devices also, and they can't be detected and they can't be removed easily. That's the whole point of them. Even if somebody steals your phone, they can't just easily remove that app. That's what it's for. Find my iPhone. They call them low jack for cars and stuff. So root kits are malware or, for that matter, software that installs itself and changes the heart of the operating system, the part that is always in memory, the part that is used to control the hardware. And if you infect it at that level, it is very difficult to remove. It's not in user land where normal applications are. It's in the heart of the machine. You pretty much have to replace the whole OS from zero to get rid of it. And for some of them, even that won't do it because it infects other parts of the hardware that are not in the normal memory space. But those are pretty exotic. Although the first spreading BIOS worm I saw two weeks ago is coming. There is malware that lives on the motherboard, not in the hard drive and not in the RAM. So even if you reinstall the whole OS, you haven't got rid of it. That's possible, it's just pretty exotic, and not too many people are at that level yet, except for the espionage and military, targeted attacks. Typical criminal spreading stuff is not having to go to that level just yet, but it'll come. So um, in order to make it secure, um, in order to sell computers to government agencies, Microsoft has adopted meeting the military security standards. So they put the trusted platform module, and this is a Navy term from the, blue, from the orange book. They defined a computer system that would be secure enough to handle classified material, and they said it must be a trusted computing platform. And so Microsoft put the trusted platform module on it to make their computer meet that level. And the point of a trusted platform module is you have a place to put secrets, like cryptographic keys, and it is stored in a special coprocessor, so it is not anywhere in the address space of the microprocessor. Your microprocessor can refer to RAM from zero to say four gigabytes or whatever you have, and none of that is the TPM. The TPM is a separate chip. The secrets are in there, and you can't get in there. All you can do is say, TPM, I've received the correct password, decrypt the disk. And it will decrypt the disk for you, but the key will never be available to you, so no one can steal it. Apple has the same thing in their phones. It's called a secure element. If you use Apple Pay, your credit card information is stored in a special chip so no app can see it. So nobody can infect your machine in any way to steal it. That's the idea. And this is very effective. Um, Android phones do not all have it. Some of them have a software simulation, which is much less secure. But the higher end Android phones, I've been told, now have a, a secure element also. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. There is an attack against TPM. Uh, in, in San Francisco, um, Joe Grand got in the TPM. You know, what he did was he dissolved the plastic with acid and reached in with a tiny needle and found the pin with the key and got it off that way. He had to destroy a hundred of them to get it. That's what you've got to do. It is science fiction, but it, nothing's perfect. There is an attack, but that's a pretty exotic attack. Right, if it was really important enough, you could get it, but that's, that's, that's pretty good security. You, unless TomTom's gonna go to that level, which I think they're not for most of us, you're not that important. But if you were plotting to kill the president, they would probably get in the TPM. You know, that could, in principle, be done, but it's a million dollar activity. Anyway, um, so there are systems you buy that are already compromised. A bunch of people sell hardware and software that already has uh, infections that happen in the supply chain. And of course, there's LoJack. There are things you put in um, 
that like Sony did this. Sony put a uh, copy protection in their music. So when you bought a song, it would mark your machine so you know which machine was authorized to play the song and it wouldn't play on other machines. And they did that with the rootkit. And they caused a lot of problems and ended up having to settle a huge lawsuit because it was a really bad idea to use a rootkit. It compromised the security of the whole box in serious ways. A lot of people develop software imitating the criminal software and they often come to regret it. But anyway, that's the same thing. And in order to prevent this, Microsoft has uh, been planning to move up and try to catch with Apple. iPhones are very secure and iPads, and one of the many things about them is they verify the kernel on boot up. So it has to be an unmodified, intact Apple kernel or it won't boot up. And Microsoft has been building that into Windows 8. In Windows 8 RT or the special version almost nobody used, um, the ARM version of Windows 8, I think, or whatever it was, that actually had this where it would verify the kernel when booting up so you couldn't have any kernel mode root kits anymore. But there is no consumer version of it that's in popular use that has this feature yet. Um, all right. And so if you want to protect your embedded OS, the first thing, of course, is to inventory them, find out what devices are computerized, what's running on them. Many people don't know. Then you uh, limit people who can get at them, add transport encryption on the outside, You know, put on what patches you can. And if you can't patch it, put some device on the outside protecting it, which can be patched. Um, all right, so let me play these cahoots and then I'll just spend a few minutes talking to you about another topic I just found today. It's very interesting. Here to 9B. All right. Oh, did I remember to resume the... Uh... I did, oh good. And I see a chat message. Uh... Right, a four-year degree. Okay, good, he got his answer. All right, fair enough, good. Right. Good, there come the people. Give it a few more seconds. All right, looks like this is it. Okay. So, which devices control industrial equipment? Okay, those are SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. All right, which device had the backdoor account like this? Rude cab. That was the D-Link router. Not all of them, but certain models had that vulnerability. Okay, which one was the US military attack on Iran? Huge event in cybersecurity history changed the whole world. This is when people predicted a whole new wave of more dangerous attacks, which didn't happen right away, but is happening now. You know, we up the game of cybersecurity, where cybersecurity is now a direct physical threat to hardware and people, right before it was just information. Anyway, um, which one is Dell's product? The DRAC, the Dell Remote Access Controller. And the cryptographic coprocessor that can prevent root pitch, among other things. Okay, that's the TPM. The UEFI is the booting system that can use it, but the TPM is the thing that does the cryptography and holds the keys the trusted platform module. One of the funny things is Microsoft started supporting TPMs with Vista, and the only hardware that actually supported this functionality in Vista was a Mac. There were no PCs that had it, and Macs had it. It was kind of funny. You couldn't run Vista properly except on the Mac. Anyway, so this looks like Steven again, and Peter D, okay. Peter D and Shermanator. That's Sherman, I guess. Is your name Sherman? Okay, what's your name? Okay, 
All right, fair enough. So let me show you one other thing I've been saying I would show you. I just came across a report from Kaspersky today that is very interesting, and here it is. Uh, Microsoft has these security reports. Kaspersky had a very good report. And I'm going to talk about this a lot more in my incident response class, but I thought a few of the highlights are worth covering even here. This is what it is to be a CISO, and they have surveyed a bunch of computer uh, chief information security officers at companies, and it's very interesting. Like this, are breaches inevitable? Five years ago, people said we're going to prevent breaches. Now, 86% of them have given up. They said we are going to get breached. There's not a damn thing you can buy. There is nothing you can do that will stop it. This is just going to happen. People are going to get breached. This is a big change in the industry. Five years ago, people imagined we wouldn't get hacked. Now everyone says well, everybody's getting hacked, and there's nothing you can do that will take that chance down to zero. So um, here's some risks. Cloud computing is a huge one. Everybody's putting all their stuff in the cloud, and everybody is getting hacked in the cloud. But it, and then social networks and so on, legacy IT, IoT, and shadow IT is here. These are people in your company that do stuff without the IT department knowing like your advertising department runs an Amazon server and puts a bunch of stuff on it, and you don't even know. <laughs> That's not as much of a problem as it used to be. That used to be a big one. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard of much litigation coming from exactly that, but you would think so. It's certain, and this is why, remember when we talked about how secure your IoT is, the first thing is inventory what you have. This is step one, and that is actually very hard. The first question for a company is, what is your valuable property and where is it? How many copies of that data are there and where is it? This is actually hard for many of them to answer. They really don't know. It's on people's laptops and their Gmail and their Dropbox and various teams and put it on servers you don't know about. Your first thing is you've got to at least find out what you've got and where it is. <laughs> then you can secure it. Yeah. It's a poll, yes. A poll of, of working CISOs. Well, they didn't feel that way. They put it down here. You would think so, but they, they didn't grade it out highly. And so and you ask what the consequences are, and the main thing is reputational loss and perhaps financial loss. Um, you know, this is why it's very hard for security people because you can't prove that you're making money for the company. You use up money improving the security, and you can't exactly prove that you saved the money. It's a problem. So here's the role, you know, in different areas, um, showing the main thing they're doing is ass assessing and managing cybersecurity risks and implementing technology. You're buying stuff and figuring out how to configure it. So I think I'm going to skip over some of these. The part I thought was interesting was the qualifications. Yeah. Don't spend 20% of your time actually managing. Right, but if you mostly do, right, you buy stuff and make it go. That's what you do. That's the most effective thing to do. There was a Richard Wu had a talk at the last cybersecurity club meeting that was very impressive. He had a slide of the products you might want, and there were like 100 brand names. It's nuts. Oh, but they get hacked all the time. They got stuff just like we do. Um, and so then I thought it's pretty good. The qualifications, experience is your number one thing. More than five years on a job. That's what they want is experience because training and tests aren't the same as experience. Experience is what really matters. But there are, um, a lot of them have master's degrees, like two thirds of them. Education is generally present also, and they have professional certifications. Almost half of them have the CISSP. Or if they don't have that, they have the CISM, which is a management certification. A lot of them do. Of course, a lot of them don't. About half of them don't have any certifications, but it is, the CISSP is a big step in that direction. But the main thing is experience, and they real maturity, that's probably the point of the master's degree. You're older and you have more experience, so because you're taking a lot of responsibility here, making decisions will affect your company. So anyway, I think the rest of this we'll talk about in my other class, but I thought I'd bring up hiring. They're having huge trouble finding people. The most, and here's the people they can't find. Pen testers are pretty high. Malware analysis right at the top. Cloud and network security and so on. Uh, these are the pain points where they can't find enough talented people to hire, which we're hearing a lot of news about the 3 million jobs they can't fill and all that. Uh, there are not enough trained people ready to take these jobs. Yeah. So, like, so now what analysts is it the hardest people? To find, yes. So, uh, they also make the highest 
Well, probably not. That's a very good question. Do they make the highest pay? I would say not. There was an industry speaker who came earlier, uh, like maybe last semester, and it was very interesting. She said the people who make the most money are software developers, and they can make 300 grand. Because if you think about it, they make the product that you sell. All the rest of this is support, and security is a cost center. This is something I had a guy who came several times to give talks here, and he said, if you want to progress in a company, what you do is position yourself in the direct line of what makes the money. So move into like marketing or sales or something where you have your hand on the thing that actually brings in the money, then you'll move up. If you're on the side, like IT is typically a side thing and security is typically a side thing. You're not really gonna to get to the top because you're not part of the main engine. They could outsource that, but you gotta be in the main engine that really makes the money. And usually like Facebook, you sell software, the people that make the software are the ones that really drive the company. Yeah. Absolutely. Cybersecurity plus something else is very good. Security plus legal, security plus sales, security plus management. Those are very hot areas because typically the experienced MBA type managers don't have enough technical and the technical people have problems dealing with management. So you, if you can do both, there's a wide open field there. I highly recommend it. That's why I really want us to partner more with the business department. I want the business student coming here and I want us, our students learning business. Because I think what we're doing is business. What we're doing here is not science. We don't have hypotheses. It's not even really engineering. What I think we're really doing here is business. We're figuring out how to run systems so they're safe enough to get the job done. And I think it would be very good for our students to have more awareness of profit and loss and business decision making because that's what really matters. We're part of a business. And if we understand that and cooperate with it, we'll go further. I was, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about classic course for coming college a year ago. Yeah. Just worth having both skill sets. It is. I think being in the middle is a very good place to be. Of course, there's jobs everywhere if you're good, but there's a huge need for people who can bridge the gap. Anyway, I think that's all I wanted to show you guys of this. We'll talk about more of this um, in my in in instant response class. But um, it's a very yes on my news like if you, from today is the link for that thing. You'll find it uh, if you go to my homepage. It's on my news link. So you go here, and that's that the Kaspersky report should be uh, there. The, what it takes to be a CISO, that's it. That gets you the report. And yeah, you might want to change. It's very interesting reading. I just picked the highlights to put here. That's why I, I thought this was worth some time in class to a career planning and understanding what we can do. And the, the thing, there was an XKCD a week ago that gets your, there's a ton of jobs because we are all incredibly bad at our job. You, it's a very strange situation and it can't last forever. But right now, everybody's getting hacked and more people get hacked every year. So they hire more of us because we fail. It's kind of stupid, but that's where we are. Anyway, um, all right, I'm going to stop the share and go to the lab and help anybody needs help there for a while. And I'll post this video if nothing is too exciting is happening in the lab. I'll see you next week.